Hi, I'm Sam Lansman from Slowboat.com. And I'm Laura Domola from Slowboat.com. And today we'll be talking about Dixon Entrance. Dixon Entrance is the last of the significant gates of the Inside Passage. You're exposed to the Pacific Ocean here, so you get swells plus wind waves. Yeah, it's really the dividing line between Canada and the United States. So you're going to go from British Columbia into Alaska here. And it's about an 85 nautical mile trip from Prince Rupert to Ketchikan. And about half that, or a little less than half that, is actually exposed to either Chatham Sound or Dixon Entrance itself. And Chatham Sound even can get pretty choppy. That's the area just out side of Prince Rupert. And like most of these gates, mornings tend to be calmer. They are not always calmer, but they tend to be. And particularly with this one, because of the length involved, most people are getting started pretty early in the morning, near first light. So sometime in the five to six o'clock range in the summer, maybe a little bit later, but not much. And about halfway across, you'll go across the border. Interestingly, the US and Canada can't quite decide about this border. There's, really? there's, a, there's a small dispute just a few miles, and there's no practical consequence of this for us both but just a fun fact. There is, however, a time change when you go across this border. So you'll go from Pacific time to Alaska time. You'll need to set your clocks back one hour. Okay, so we leave Prince Rupert and we head out through Venn Passage. I really like Venn Passage. Yeah, it's kind of a fun piloting challenge. Yeah. It's shallow and narrow and curvy. And although the chart makes it look pretty ominous, it's never been an issue for me. I've taken boats up to about 70 feet through and there's plenty of water in there. You just want to make sure you're paying attention and not trying to cut any corners. Right. Or... The buoys are all well marked and easy to see. And... The one thing to keep in mind is there's often a lot of traffic in here. There'll be small fishing boats that are zooming past you at high rates of speed. Yep. <laughs> and I've actually had trips across Dixon Entrance where the roughest conditions were when somebody waked me in Venn Passage. <laughs> That's typically a good crossing. Yeah, I'll take it. So once you get out of Venn Passage, you're going to head northwest and you're going to head up towards Green Island. And until you get to Green Island, you're going to be out in Chatham Sound. Like I mentioned before, this area can get pretty choppy. If it's choppy in Chatham Sound, it's probably a bad sign about what's to come in Dixon Entrance. But not always and know that Chatham Sound can get pretty darn choppy, especially when the afternoon winds blow. And once I get to Green Island, I like to then set a course for a waypoint about a mile off of Tree Point and Cape Fox. And if it's rough, I like to go a little bit further out. And then from there, you can decide if you're going to head into Foggy Bay for the night or head up to I can't even pronounce the name of this. <laughs> a lot of people can't. I think that's why the locals say Revilla instead, but I think it's Revilla Gigedo, Revilla Gigedo, something like that. In any case, we'll just can. it Ketchikan. Re Revilla, <laughs> yes, Ketchikan, it's much <laughs> easier to pronounce. Yeah. So we talked about Foggy Bay here, and Foggy Bay is a really good way to break up the run from Prince Rupert up to Ketchikan, right. that 85-mile run. It's a great anchorage. I've had people on flotilla trips say to me, there's no way we can anchor in here, it's 250 feet deep or something like that. And sure enough, I look on their Navionics chart, on their phone or tablet mm -hmm. or chart plot or wherever they're wrong. looking and they've got vastly incorrect depth data so mm. so don't be deterred if you're looking at the Navionics charts they may have fixed it by now I don't know we've but, never had an issue it's a it's, great anchorage it's 40 to 60 feet deep kind yeah. of in there and beautiful anchorage almost every time I'm in there I see bears on shore I see whales on the way in it's kind of a good welcome to Alaska uh, you've got to get permission from the US Customs before anchoring here yeah and we talk more about this in the video that we did on clearing US Customs you can skip a ahead and look at the Ketchikan specific information. But or just watch the whole thing. You could watch the whole <laughs> thing too. It's all useful. So you're in the US by the time you're at Foggy Bay and you need to ask permission and receive permission before you overnight there. Because once you drop the anchor, you've touched land and you're technically in the United States and you need to have cleared customs. The other nice thing about Foggy Bay is that once you've gotten there, you're across Dixon Entrance. So you have relatively protected water from there to the 32 nautical miles left to Ketchikan. So you can put kind of the worry behind you at that point. I don't want to say you're home free, but you're in pretty good shape to have a smooth ride into Ketchikan from Great. there. Great. All right. And what are the weather resources to be looking at when planning to cross Dixon Entrance? Oh, there's so many. There are uh, a lot. <laughs> this, is a, this is a long list, and some are more important than others, and we'll talk about that additionally here. But it kind of starts with the Dixon entrance to Cape Decision NOAA marine forecast, mm -hmm. and that's a big area that that covers. And so I actually think the Dixon entrance east Environment Canada marine forecast is probably the most useful forecast. It covers the area that you're going to be transiting on a trip from Prince Rupert into Ketchikan. Also, here's the central Dixon entrance weather buoy, which can be helpful. It's further out than you'll be, of course, but you can see what's happening out there. Yeah, that gives you a real-time look at conditions out on Dixon entrance. So you mm -hmm. can see wave height and period and wind speed and direction and so forth. There's also Green Island and Triple Island light stations. Right. And Triple Island's a little far south, but mm -hmm. it can still be useful for giving you the big picture kind of view of what's going on. Green Island is right on your route. So if you're hearing four or five foot at Green Island, is probably a day that you want to stay tied to the dock. 
And then there are a few more automated stations. These are land-based stations, but Lucy Island and Gray Island and Rose Spit. And as you can see, these cover a big area, but they're all useful in building a picture of the current and expected weather. Which is really what all of the, I mean, this is a big list, yes, but that's what it's for. You get used to building a picture by looking at all of them and seeing what's happening. Right, and dare I add a couple more in here. I find the Clarence Strait NOAA marine forecast is actually more representative of what I'm going to experience on the route from mm -hmm. Prince Rupert to Ketchikan than the Dixon Entrance to Cape Decision forecast. That Dixon Entrance to Cape Decision forecast often has really frightening sounding wave heights. <laughs> it's further out in Dixon Entrance towards the ocean side and out offshore into the Gulf of Alaska. I don't tend to put a whole lot of stock in that forecast, but I would be concerned if I was seeing vast differences between the NOAA forecast and the Environment Canada forecast. And also Hecate Strait, that's another one. Hecate Strait is that body of water between Haida Gwaii and the mainland in British Columbia. And yeah. so the northern half of Hecate Strait can give some clues about what's happening on Dixon Entrance. Okay, let's talk about our minimums and what we like for a successful Dixon Entrance crossing. We like the wind forecast to be under 20 knots. Yep, and I might go a little bit beyond that. I mm -hmm. might go on a forecast that was 15 to 25, it was going to be behind me. Yeah. And especially if I knew the alternative was waiting for a long time in Prince Rupert. I don't like pushing things because of weather, but at 15 to 25, it's more of an uncomfortable thing than an unsafe thing. Right. And I'm looking for combined seas less than two meters of the Dixon Entrance buoy. Obviously, the smaller the better, and the further apart these waves are, the better. So keep that in Mind. And then at Green Island Light Station, I want to see two foot chop or less. We've talked about the three foot moderate and four foot and five foot. Three foot moderate is really marginal. It's going to be bumpy, not the most fun crossing, but. My favorite from the Green Island Light Station is seas rippled. Yes. Yes. Wind palm <laughs> seas rippled. Wind palm seas rippled. That's when you want to be out there. And yep. I've gone across Dixon Entrance when it was just flat as can be. You could Same water here. ski across. It was unbelievable. So it's not like this area is inherently awful no. or is always going to be bad. A lot of times in the summer when it's quite calm and no big deal to get across. And then we've got some winds that come out of Portland Inlet. Yeah, very occasionally you'll hear about a forecast for inflow or outflow winds from Portland Inlet, and that's this big canal that extends up into the mainland. And those I don't find generally to have much impact, but occasionally they do, and so it's something to watch out for. If Environment Canada is calling for big inflow or outflow winds, it can get pretty snotty right outside of Portland Inlet. All right, it's also good to be aware of the traffic around you. There's no VTS in Alaska, and there are a lot of fishing boats. There are a lot of commercial fishing boats, yeah. a lot of recreational boats, and as you get closer to Ketchikan, it's amazing how the traffic increases. And so you'll have cruise ships and the Alaska State Bird, which is alternatively the Mosquito or the De Havilland <laughs> Beaver seaplane. As you get into Ketchikan, the seaplane traffic is pretty unbelievable. Yeah. You've got tour boats that are taking cruise ship passengers down to Misty Fjords, and it really becomes a very chaotic scene. Well, as you and get also so it's quite a bit of a shock coming from the northern BC coast right. into Ketchikan. Right. Like, whoa! And commercial traffic in Alaska is almost always monitoring channels 16 and 13 on the VHF. And 13 is kind of the preferred bridge to bridge make contact channel. It keeps all the clutter off of 16. 16. Right. So the fishing boats are often working in Dixon Entrance, and it's important to avoid their nets. That's a really good way to ruin your day and theirs if you run over their net. It's expensive, it causes potential damage to your boat in addition to their net. And, and they're hard to see. The little buoys that are on the top of the net that yeah, float on the surface can be really difficult to see, especially if it's a little rough. If there's any chop or white yeah. caps, I find that a good pair of binoculars make a big difference right. and you'll spot this, and especially stabilized binoculars. But the best method is to just give all the fishing boats a third of a nautical mile berth. So set a range ring on your radar for a third of a nautical mile, keep anything out of that range, and you're not going to have any trouble with fishing nets. So if you're up by Green Island and things are looking dicey and you're not enjoying your ride and you want to wait for another day, a good duck out point is Brundage Inlet up on the north end of the Dundas Islands. Good anchorage in there. I will warn you, there are a lot of horse flies in there. But you can still get out of the weather and stay indoors and, and right. you won't get eaten alive. But it's a good duck out point in case the conditions are deteriorating or they're worse than you expected. So I shot this video last year coming across Dixon Entrance and we had about 20 knots of wind behind us. And so you can see that the boat's moving a little bit. There was probably a one to three foot following sea, depending where we were, plus a swell. And the boat moves a little bit. The autopilot has to work a little bit harder, but it's not a particularly uncomfortable ride. And after all this, you're in Alaska. Thanks so much for listening. If you have any questions, just let us know in the comments section or visit slowboat.com and click contact us. And thanks for joining us. To see more of our educational boating videos, subscribe to our Slow Boat YouTube channel. If you're on Facebook, you can follow us at facebook.com slash slowboatlife. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at slowboatlife. 
And of course, you can always find us on slowboat.com. Until next time, see you on the water. Mm-hmm.